So hello everybody. I just got a phone call telling me that I'm online and you can thank you very much for joining us. My name is Tade and uh, I'll try to actually share with you whatever I know in the way I see how CGM can help us in a way that deal with people that have diabetes and of course, how this can help people with diabetes. So maybe we wait for a couple more seconds. It's probably a minute till noon Eastern time in the United States. And we are starting a beautiful evening here in Slovenia. I will show you in the end my view through the window. Maybe I can tell you initially a little bit about my background. I'm a physician. I treat uh, people that have diabetes and also other endocrine disorders and uh, our actually institution is a is a university that actually cares for almost a thousand young people with type 1 diabetes with only a couple from time to time with type 2 diabetes and several thousand with other endocrine or inborn diseases. So it's a big institution, 12,000 outpatient visits a year, only in our department for diabetes and endocrinology. Okay, now I believe it's noon. Hello again to all of you and thank you very much for, for, for joining us. I will, I will start uh, with the lecture. Those are my conflicts of interest. If you want to go through them slowly. And I, I would like to share with you a little bit of a background first, why I believe actually that we do have to upgrade whatever we are doing with people who have diabetes. And of course, I'll touch the role of CGM I will touch cost effectiveness as particularly in public systems like most countries in the European Union and some in the United States actually have. I will of course touch a little bit advisors and new possibilities that these devices or, or algorithms if you want give us. I will then in the end close with a time in range targets that were recently agreed upon by an international consensus group and published in Diabetes Care. So if we touch the background, I think it's important that we realize that even in the best countries, the most, if you want, sophisticated societies like Sweden, type one diabetes, it's still a deadly disease. So this is the Swedish registry data published in the Lancet last year. As you can see here, actually, if you get diabetes before the age of 10 here, you can see that your life expectancy actually is 17 years less. And even if you get diabetes late, between 25, 26, and 30 years, your life expectancy is still considerably lower, about 10 years lower, as compared to people without type 1 diabetes. So it's a serious disease with serious consequences. What's probably more striking, at least it was more striking to me, is that the risk is double in women. Here you have all-cause mortality. And please look, if you got your diabetes between the age of 0 and 10, your risk is 3, roughly, if you're a male, and your risk is 6 if you're a female. And this is more pronounced if we look at the acute myocardial infarction here, where the risk, if you're a female and you got diabetes, actually is almost 100 times higher, whereas considerably less so if you're a male. So this male to female difference actually is, at least to me, a very important question. And obviously, 
we should ask themselves, are females with type 1 diabetes underserved or potentially there is a physiologic reason that we see this huge discrepancy in risks in between the two genders with people with diabetes. And the second important message actually is that you don't have to be really rich and beautiful to get the outcome. So this is actually a nice study from rich and beautiful. Here you have Sweden, you have Germany, you have Austria, Denmark, Norway, all the best. But as you can see, actually, the mean A1C is not really beautiful in all these affluent environments. And this is our little country. We are need neither rich nor beautiful, but we can actually approach the outcome of Sweden through probably organizational and probably educational means that we have and are not so costly and obviously through the use of technology, particularly CGM and pumps. I would also like to draw your attention in my introduction to the SWEET database. SWEET actually used to be a European Union funded research program and is now a beautiful association of many, many tens of centers all around the world. And you upload the data to this SWEET database and you get a benchmark report. And last year's benchmark report actually put our center here. So we were happy actually to be in the green part of this of these columns but we as you can all see actually have still quite some room for improvement so every time we get this benchmark report i call up a meeting of my department and we actually do plans on how to get slightly more into this left side of the column to get even even better and to improve the outcomes of our people with diabetes and you know, there are several frustrating reports this year. So this is the type one exchange cohort that demonstrated a worsened control in the last part of, of, of let's say the new millennium as compared to the first part, particularly in the younger age groups, extremely frustrating results. And yes, and a good actually incentive to discuss and to improve. And even in Denmark, if you want, another very, if you want, very frustrating outcome that the social background is still so important, even in Denmark. This is actually the outcome. This is the mean A1C from disease onset, stratified by mother's education. As you can see, actually, if a mother has a high school or a bachelor or a master degree, the difference in A1C is more than a percent. So very huge consequences long term and the mother's education actually being so important. This is the outcome, and this is the number of measurements per day, which roughly represents how they actually use the means that are readily available in Denmark. So I believe that all this, in a way, frustrating messages should prompt us to make a plan or to decide on how to improve these outcomes and basically unify or make the outcomes for people with diabetes more even or, and, and of course better. It's not only bad news. I would like to congratulate the Scottish colleagues. This is the overall outcome in Scotland. As you can see, no major difference over the years in A1C, but here you see the pediatric part of the Scottish registry and they really improved also with the use of technology. So I'm really, really happy and proud for the Scottish pedandos, actually for their achievement. And finally, I'd like to draw your attention to the brain. Brain is not a very in focus part of our body in relation to diabetes, but the direct net trial, the direct net group in the United States did beautiful work and they demonstrated that the brain volume in several important parts of the brain is actually smaller in young people with diabetes. And here actually, interestingly enough, this was not related to severe hypoglycemia or seizures. It was actually related to hyperglycemia. In this study, the glucose standard deviation was significantly associated with the changes in functional MRI. And in the follow-up of these people published last year, actually, they showed that it was hyperglycemia and obviously, the, the, the duration of the disease and some other factors that affected the brain damage the most. So an extremely important message, it's actually hyperglycemia 
that was associated with the damage to this, to this young brain, if you want, of young individuals with diabetes. But this is, of course, not related to young brain. There are several studies. I just actually will show you a couple of them with, that demonstrating that there is cognitive deficits, cognitive impairment in people with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. And this impairment is in another study related to glycosylated hemoglobin. The higher, the worse is the outcome. And funnily enough, if you look at the origin trial recalculated for hypoglycemia and incident cognitive dysfunction, as you can see here, actually, non-severe hypoglycemia was related to a decreased risk of cognitive dysfunction. Probably not because of hypoglycemia, but because the mean glucose was very likely lower and there was less hyperglycemia. Whereas severe hyperglycemia was not associated with an increased risk for cognitive dysfunction in this particular study that included 11,500 people with type 2 diabetes. Another, I think, very interesting piece of evidence is the CARDIA study. They checked healthy young individuals at the age of 20 for several cardiac-related risk factors and outcomes, and they re-evaluated them when they were 50, 30 years later. And the important part for us actually is that greater variability, they were healthy individuals, greater variability in the fasting blood glucose that they measured a couple of times only with a very simple method that they had 30 years ago was associated with worse cognitive processing, with worse attention and worse memory in midlife. So in healthy people, if glucose went slightly higher or more variable, fasting glucose actually, this was related to poor, poorer cognitive outcome in this particular study. And of course, even when the big studies were done in, in, in electronic data records, they were able to associate, interestingly enough, not all dementia, but only vascular-related dementia with type 2 diabetes. You can see a very, very pronounced increase in risk related to the presence of type 2 diabetes. So having all this plus minus frustrating data in our minds, actually, we certainly want to seek for solutions that would improve these outcomes and reduce the burden, obvious burden of diabetes. The ADA and the, uh, the, the European Association for the Study of Diabetes made a distinction in between real-time CGM that also gives you warnings and predictive alerts and alarms and intermittently scanned CGM that would actually only show you current glucose and with downloads, show you also the continuous glucose data, but no alerts or alarms. This, was, this is the classical distinction in between the two. And if you look at 219 ADA standards of care actually for real time, you see that most evidence is already graded as A. As recently as I will try to share with you, there is re really a, a huge amount of evidence supporting the use of real-time CGM in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. The first randomized controlled trial with, an, with a transcutaneous sensor was published in 2006. And when we did this study actually with real-time CGM, the results were so good that nobody wanted to believe us. As you can see here, actually, this was the control group and this was the, the, the group that used CGM at that time more, and this was the half use of CGM. As you can see, actually, it was a dose-dependent effect, and the difference here is just, is just big. But then the big trials came. So first, the, the JDRF trial, you know, well-powered trial, well-designed, randomized controlled trial that included more than 300 people with, with type 1 diabetes. Half of them, or probably a quarter of them, were on MDI, and the rest of them were on pumps. And yes, the outcome for the adults was a very significant sustained reduction in glycosylated hemoglobin all over for 0.5%, and this was highly significant. Fortunately, this trial didn't work so well for adolescents and children, and the reason for this was that they didn't wear, really, the sensor at, at, the, at the necessary amount of time during the trial. But when they recalculated the data in this publication, for those that did use the sensor, as you can see here, actually, 
DH was not an issue anymore because also the, the pediatric and adolescent part, if they use the sensor, the decrease of A1C was very significant. Same is true for hypoglycemia risk. So this is the famous DCCT original graph from the publication from 93. And you can see actually, when you just put the JDRF trial, the control group to the same graph, the picture for hypoglycemia is completely different. So after 30 years, we don't see this amount of hypoglycemia anymore. So this is the JDRF control group, the amount of hypoglycemia. And this is the study groups with CGM. As you can see, actually, even with a lower A1C, there is less hypoglycemia. So with the CGM, the paradigm of this lower A1C and up hypoglycemia is not true, is not relevant anymore. Even when you reduce the A1C, actually, the amount of hypoglycemia is less compared to the control standard therapy group. We designed the first trial where the primary endpoint was hypoglycemia, time spent in hypoglycemia here. It, was, it had actually a very strong outcome because, as you can see, the time in hypoglycemia below 63 was reduced by half. This was almost one hour, and here it was half an hour. Interestingly enough, even at that time, also time in range was increased. At that time, time in range was really not a, a, a marker, an outcome. So we didn't comment this, really. But now we understand how important, actually, this was in conjunction uh, of, of reduction of hypoglycemia. And then recently, as I mentioned previously, the big trials were published. So the DIAMOND trial, this one from the United States, a beautifully designed randomized controlled trial, actually CGM versus standard of care with SMBG, half a year. This is the baseline data of A1C. And here you have the week 12 data and week 24 data. As you all can see, it's a significant decrease in glycosylated hemoglobin, also clinically relevant, clinically meaningful in this particular trial. And importantly, the mean uh, usage of CGM, as you can see here, more than six days a week actually, was 90% and more. So obviously enough use was necessary to get these good results. And also important actually, a group above 60 had exactly the same outcome as group in between 25 years and 60 years, which is another important message also you know, the, the, the how to say, the, the device age actually benefits comparably to those that are slightly younger. Time in range increased very significantly, as you can see here in, in, in median minutes per day. Still, this is only around 50% of the daily time in range, which is, as you will see later, below our current recommendation. And this is hypoglycemia, every threshold you use, even 70, either 70, 60, or 50, it was significantly decreased. And then actually the, the European counterpart of the, of the diamond trial was performed again, a beautiful, a beautiful design, and the results very comparable to what was published in the United States. And then this trial actually came, which used actually all treatment modalities with technology in a single study, the commissar. I'll just like to show you this set of data. As you can see, this is the standard injections. So, so MDI plus SMBG. And this is if you add pumps and you have a small, small improvement. But if you add actually our real-time CGM, then the real shift happens. You shift down by almost 1% the MDI group and you shift down by almost 1% the pump group. And of course, both these differences are highly significant. A very similar trial actually was performed recently in, in Italy. And here actually they had uh, quite a big number. So almost 400 newly diagnosed people with type 1 diabetes. And they also used all four groups as in previous trial to test all different technology modalities that are available. And here you can easily see again the beautiful incremental 
improvement. So this is the standard therapy, which is MDI plus SMBG. This happens if you add an insulin pump, a significant improvement. This is if you add a, a real-time CGM at the beginning, even more significant. And this actually is if you have all, if you have a pump and a sensor then not work together. And the time frame is 2.5 years. So it's actually a, a, I think, quite impressive time frame. As you can see, a sustained improvement in all groups using technology and really make this case for the early adoption of technology in the course of type two, I'm sorry, of type one diabetes, very strong. This was the effect, if you calculate the net effect of the, of the pump and the sensor, in both cases with MDI or, or with the pump, as you can see, it's really impressive and clinically and clinically meaningful. What's also important is that emergency department visits actually very significantly decrease for 11% in CGM users, which of course is related additionally to cost savings. And then the GOLD trial actually that add a different, an additional angle in a crossover design. So this is type people with type one diabetes on multiple daily injection only crossover design, CGM first or SMBG first and then washout period. And the other part of the trial, you can see a very pronounced reduction in A1C when the CGM was in use and a complete reversal actually back to the, to the starting point here when the CGM was not used anymore. Interestingly, this graph is exactly the same as we published several years ago for, for, for uh, our, in our switch trial actually. Switch was because we, it was again at crossover design. As you can see here actually, when the sensor was used, when the sensor was on, a very significant decrease in A1C washout period exactly back to the same and then the switchover in this group actually dropped in A1C because they used the CGM. So now this is basically seven years ago and the, the GOLD trial nicely repeated these results for the MDI group. We have more out of this trial here actually. This is CGM for hypoglycemia for adults with type 1 on MDI. As you can see, a beautiful reduction of hypoglycemia. This is time below 70 here. This is when sensor is used, wash out, and this is when the, group, the other group used the sensor. As you can see, a very similar picture. So a simultaneous improve in, 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 in glycosylated hemoglobin and reduction in hypoglycemia, contrary to the DCCT dogma, as I started initially. Same picture for time below 54 milligram percent here. And then the, 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 the well-known replace study with a single aim to show that a CGM can completely replace uh, SMBG without harm to people with diabetes. Well, well-powered trial, multi-center, 40 centers participated. And actually, as you can see, this is the primary outcome. So this is SMBG, CGM, I'm sorry, alone, or CGM with SMBG, no difference whatsoever. So if you had CGM alone, the outcomes actually were exactly the same. And the final message, of course, is that CGM can be used as a standalone therapy decision tool. This is just, you know, more data, and you can see on A1C, on mean glucose, on coefficient of variation, all, as you can see, easily look exactly the same. So no difference if you remove SMBG for the real-time CGNs. Hypoglycemia, again, exactly the same. And hyperglycemia, exactly the same. So the conclusion was no harm to the patient. Recently, HYPO-D study was published, and this study focused on people that are hypoglycemia prone because several other trials excluded people that were hypoglycemia prone. So a very, very strong and precise design actually with, with, with baseline, uh, with therapy phase and with follow-up. And the outcome was based on the CGM, also very precise definition of what exactly was counted as a hypoglycemic event with a threshold of the agreed 54 milligram per deciliter. And actually the, the outcome, of course, low glucose events was significantly improved with, with the RTCGM. Here you can see the striking, striking difference 
in the follow-up phase, and the beautiful shift of hypoglycemia frequency to the left when real-time CGM was, was used. What's important is that also hypoglycemia requiring third-party assistance actually was very significantly reduced when RT-CGM was used, which is an additional piece of evidence important for this particular focus. But finally, to me, the most important probably study was the study in pregnancy, because here the outcome is not an imaginative glycosylated hemoglobin or anything like this, but it's a simple biological outcome, which is the weight of the newborn baby. So this beautiful randomized controlled trial primary outcome actually was change in A1C, which was significantly improved when this ladies with type 1 diabetes used CGM during pregnancy. But time in target range, which is the stringent target range that's used for pregnancy, because in pregnancy, as you know, blood glucose is physiologically lower, was actually significantly increased when CGM was used here at week 34 as compared to control. So a significant improvement in this stringent time in range. But the most important part, the LGA, large for gestational age babies, were significantly reduced by, by more than 15%, actually. And when you calculate the number to treat needed to get this outcome, the numbers are very low. So six for this LGA outcome, and particularly important, six for the NICU admission. The NICU admission was actually on average a day less when RTCGM was used. Here actually have, you, you have length of stay in the hospital, also almost a day shorter in the group that used CGM during the pregnancy. And finally, the question whether CGM is also usable, also successful in type two diabetes. Many of you will remember that this was always difficult to prove for SMBG. And that's why many countries, SMBG for type two, particularly if not on insulin, was not reimbursed or used. But here is a different story. This nicely designed randomized controlled trial from the United States actually powered to show the difference properly. Uh, obviously, you know, the first author is probably the best guarantee that the statistical part was, was brilliant in this particular trial. Uh, showed actually that if I go briefly again, it was a run in, it was actually weeks four to 12, where was the treatment period, and week 24, which was the end of the observational phase. And they reduced the number of visits to make sure that the trial situation is comparable to the real life situation in, in let's say, routine care of this population. They actually showed that, the, again, the usage was extremely high, above 90% of days of sensory use, and the primary outcome at week 12 already, and at the end of week 24, a significant improvement in A1C in this population with type 2 diabetes using real-time CGM. Also, uh, time in range, this is minutes per day, actually uh, in range, significantly improved, below range, below 70, significantly improved, and above range, above 180, significantly improved. Also, a recent meta-analysis actually, interestingly, demonstrated that for real-time CGM, actually, all trials included, there is a significant improvement in A1C when real-time CGM is used. And also, when only randomized controlled trials were included into the meta-analysis, actually, this significance is even stronger. So it's actually a very important, uh, how to say, proof that real-time CGM also has a significant effect, beneficial effect, in people with type 2 diabetes. But that's touch cost effectiveness, because many times the price of all this technology is the culprit for non-using it. I would like to start with this trial actually was published in JCM last year from Belgium. It's a public insurance initiated trial. Public insurance in Belgium required this study in order to reimburse real-time CGM. And yes, the outcomes were improved and the A1C were lower, but what I wanted to share with you is that by using CGM, there was an overall reduction of costs. 
So using this technology was not more expensive, it was actually less expensive for one third of a million of euros in one year. And the reason was less severe hypoglycemia, less hospital admissions, less sick days, and less absence from work. So extremely important outcomes that actually demonstrating cost savings in this population with type one diabetes using real-time CGM. Very recently, two months ago, also data from the pregnancy CGM trial, the CONCEPT trial were published, calculated for the, for the pregnancy outcomes. And here, the savings are huge. So if you calculate this for United Kingdom, actually, you may show an almost 10 million pounds, which is roughly 10 million dollars or euros plus minus savings when pregnant ladies with type 1 diabetes use CGM, real-time CGM. So I think an extremely important paper that will actually make the use of CGM, real-time CGM during pregnancy, a no-brainer. So it's effective, it reduces an ICU stay of newborns, it improves the large for gestational age outcome, and it saves money. I think a very, very serious message to all public insurance systems all over the world. Finally, with all this data overload, people that use CGM, real-time CGM, and also diabetologists or healthcare professionals or primary physicians that treat people with diabetes may need advisors. Advisors are algorithms that help to decide, identify which is good, but decide on the specific dosing, which is considerably better. And yes, of course, this algorithm, these devices, must be tested, must be verified, and very likely must be approved by the authorities for this particular use. Recently, Tidepool actually, which is a free platform, so it's, it's really costless for people with diabetes as well as for institutions, uh, was able actually to include really everybody. As you can see here, actually, you can, you can use the Dexcom GC download. You can use it for Omnipod download, for Tandem. You can use it for, for, for Freestyle Libre. And you can also use it for the newest uh, hybrid closed loop Metronic 670G. So everybody through one platform, you get a one single data presentation that actually is also compliant with the new consensus. So I think a very, very nice option that is provided to all of us by JDRF. JDRF actually sponsored this free site so that it can be used by all of us. And then, you know, first is this analysis of massive real-time CGM data that it should be performed actually by, a, by an algorithm that will assist and speed up the process. So we did a study two years ago now and compared the decision making. It was actually, an, if you want, an in silico study. P -p Physicians, diabetologists from 17 centers, more than 40 of them, got patients on paper. And they made decisions on dose changing. And the same was done by the algorithm. And interestingly enough, actually, the discrepancies between endocrinologists, diabetologists, and in, among them, and discrepancies between the algorithm were exactly the same. So we actually concluded that algorithm advisor is just another team member, actually, another new member that we can ask for a very, very quick advice. It works, of course, within minutes. So this advisor actually was the first dose advising algorithm that got the FDA approval, actually. So it's, it's a product that can be used for advising on dosing in people with type 1 diabetes. And yes, actually, it analyzes the data. So basically, very quickly, it would actually take everything from the sensor and from the pump in, analyze, give you specific observations on the data. And most importantly, it will give you specific recommendation on the dosing, either on the basal rates, if this was a pump, or on the carb ratio to cover your meals with the boluses or into the insulin sensitivity ratios to make your correction bolus decisions. So you will get a specific dosing advice from this FDA approved and CE marked, of course, advisor that can help you decide actually whenever you are in, in a hurry or 
you believe that you know the data is so conflicting that you need that you need some help. Here, actually, just a much a little bit bigger example on the recommended basal rate changes that you get on a click from the button. Actually, so you download the data, and if you have this advisor, actually, you click the button and you get your specific dosing recommendation after the analysis of the downloads for your particular individual with diabetes. This is the bolus plan for meals, as I showed you previously. And of course, you get specific suggestions on how to advise this individual with diabetes based on the, on the downloaded data analysis. So this advisor can work as a professional advisor inside your hospital system or inside your downloading system, something like Tidepool or whatever you use, or in hopefully very near future, can be used actually by people with diabetes at home and studies are ongoing actually to prove this, this, this more, if you want, option that's even closer to people with diabetes. Finally, I propose you to discuss briefly the time in range targets. When we actually used for so many years the dicosylated hemoglobin, it became apparent very early that on the individual basis, actually, glycosylated hemoglobin may not represent mean blood glucose for individual people with diabetes. And this was first stressed in this trial by Nathan and basically discovered by Al Hirsch from Washington that really started to accumulate evidence, actually, that A1C may not be the best thing for personal recommendations of individual people with diabetes. And then the JDR F study followed, and yes, clearly showed that a person with a mean like oscillated hemoglobin of seven can have a mean glucose of 115 or a mean glucose of 190, this one being excellent and this one being terrible. So this actually prompted, you know, authors of this paper to say that they are very important differences, very important discrepancies in between A1C and mean glucose. So A1C on an individual basis may not really tell the risk or the, if you want, mean control of a particular individual with diabetes. So two years ago, we actually gathered our first consensus and tried to say what are the, what are the measures, the outcomes that we propose. And yes, time in range was the most important one, but there were several. We came up with a recommendation of 15 different key metrics, actually. Time in range being among them, hypoglycemia thresholds, same as agreed upon by the, by the ADA, EISD task force, and also glucose variability. But then this year, actually, we decided to try to agree on specific treatment targets. And there were very, very smart people with us, like Boris Kovacev, Lutz Heinemann scientists, that were calculating initially what time in range really means and how can we use this data. And we came after thorough discussion, first in groups, in different angles, and then in a panel discussion where recommendations were voted on, and came on with this, with this, with this actually clinical recommendation that was endorsed formally by the American Diabetes Association, by the International Association for the, for the Adolescent Diabetes, by ESPAT, by the JDRF, by the American Association of Diabetes Educators, by the Foundation of European Nurses in Diabetes, by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, by the Pediatric Endocrine Society, and by the European Association for the Study of Diabetes. So, as you can see, most relevant professional organizations formally endorsed this consensus. And the consensus is, is actually simple because our scientists in the, in the group of, of 34 people, of 43 people, I'm sorry, demonstrated that we can use a single target for type one and type two diabetes based on available data. And in this previously agreed target range, which is 70 to 180, or if you use millimoles, 3.9 to 10, Whatever is above 70% of time in range, which is a pro of, the, of the daily time, which is approximately 17 hours, this seven seems to be very important, is okay. And this 
by calculation on retrospective data is very similar to a mean A1C of seven. So really resounds as a, as a, as a likely acceptable target. With this, we also defined time below range and time above range. Importantly for time below range, time below 70 or 3.9, which is the first threshold, should be below one hour or below 4% of the day. And time below 54 or the second level should be below 15 minutes a day, which is 1% of the day. And similarly for time above range, the thresholds are 180 or 10, which means less than six hours a day at this point, and above 25, less than one hour, a good hour a day, above 250, I'm sorry, less than a good hour a day uh, in this very high range. We had a similar, uh, an, a mandate recommendation for people at an increased risk, which sometimes is an older age, advanced age, or several comorbidities. And here actually the aim is more focused on hypoglycemia on time below range, and here, the time below 70 should be below 15 minutes a day, and the time inside the range should be around half of the day. But we also limited the very high glucose, just to make sure these people are not too high most of their day. The consensus for pregnancy was extremely difficult, and here uh, Professor Murphy, Cal Murphy from UK, really did a marvelous job in actually forging this consensus for type 1 diabetes and pregnancy. Again, the target is the same, but please note that the range is lower because physiologically, as I mentioned earlier, the range of glucose is lower during pregnancy. We, however, were unable at that point to make a, a consensus for type 2 diabetes. Here, the discrepancies between targets in different parts of the world are still big. But I do hope that within a very short time frame, also here, an international consensus will be reached. This is the standard representation of time in range that is now getting more and more popularity. So the green is time in range is, is, is 70 to 180. And then, you know, it's the level above, the yellow, the first level, and the second level, which is between 180 and 250 in gray, and hypoglycemia in red or dark red if it's below 50. For the standard that will now hopefully be in every download and in every data representation. A crucial part of our consensus is this standardized ambulatory glucose profile, because we believe that the standardized data presentation from whatever device is used on whatever environment is used is crucial. This will ease the work for healthcare professionals and particularly will ease the understanding and the you know, adoption of whatever we teach by people with diabetes. So this standardized representation, the AGP report, is a crucial part of our international consensus and is luckily being adopted by most important players, including the tight pool, as I mentioned previously. Let me propose to you a couple of conclusions. So as I hopefully demonstrated to you is that we now have an abundant grade eight evidence published to say that CGM, either standalone or in combination with other devices, actually improves glycemic control and hypoglycemia, significantly improves pregnancy outcomes, and I didn't show data, but there is published data on increase in quality of life. Time in range as a new clinical target, there are clear guidance now published, is a new marker both for clinical and research purposes, and hopefully because during the consensus process, individuals with diabetes, non-medical individuals with diabetes, were extremely active. We hope that these targets, these new outcomes, will be actually acceptable by many individuals with diabetes and can be more easily used in the day-to-day -day management by just looking at the time in range and the amount of time spent within range and thus basically controlling the long-term outcomes outcomes every hour of a single day. And also I would like to propose to you to refocus a little bit on the human brain. I showed you data that human brain is seriously affected but by hyperglycemia, by high blood glucose. So also from this point to reduce cognitive impairment in young and adult people with diabetes, the focus of on time in range 
may be crucial. And finally, advisors can help this overload of data actually may pose challenges in many environments. And yes, algorithms for aromatic analysis of data and for specific dosing recommendation may be of great help to many. For the conclusion, just another way of using a sensor. But of course, I have to warn you that this would be an off-label use. With this, I invite you all to our ATTD meeting, our 13th meeting that will be February 19 to 22nd in Madrid, in Spain. Everybody's welcome, warm and wide, all new data on artificial pancreas and on all different devices, implantable sensors actually is, is coming to this meeting and will be presented along with several workshops to use different novel technologies. And with this, this is my team. They have to work while I speak. Thank you very much for your attention. And maybe at some point we meet, and I'll be very happy to reply to your questions. Thank you very much for spending time with me and for your attention. <laughs>